let's stand together and sing to the one who deserves our praise. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know,
Hey Liberty, it's Pastor Drew, and I'm so glad that you've decided to join us this Sunday morning. If this is your first time with us, then I want to say a special thanks just for checking us out and being a part of worship with us here today. Make sure that you check out the information desk on your way out this morning so that we can get to know you and help you get connected here a little bit better as well. I have a special announcement just for the guys in the room today, and in just a few weeks, we will have our No Regrets Men's Conference. And this is one that you will not want to miss. There is going to be some great food, awesome prizes to win, and a lot of great interaction just being real with the guys here at Liberty. Feel free to invite friends, family, and even your teenage sons. The whole point of this men's conference is for us to see each other live a life with no regrets. And I can honestly say that even as a pastor, these conferences have been an absolute life changer for me. So check out our website or on the Church Center app and register today. We also have three brand new Bible studies that are going to be starting up, and these are for everyone. It makes such a difference in our lives when we get closer to people around us and get closer to God together. So make sure that you go and check out the lobby to get more information about each of these studies and to sign up. Now, let's keep singing and praising our God together this morning. Yeah. 
turn this thing around God turn it around God turn it around God turn it around I'm calling on the name that changes everything God turn it around God turn it around God turn it around Should have a seat this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Worship arts team, great job today. Let's give them a hand, man. Awesome, awesome uh, worship today. I love the redemptive theme. Uh, 
Jesus will not fail us. He's a firm foundation. He can turn things around. And, you know, God uses his church in the lives of people to turn things around, to get their attention, to help them grow in their faith. And we re really want to challenge you this uh, 2023 to get involved, get connected, get engaged here at Liberty uh, beyond just the one hour on Sunday mornings, okay? So a place that starts if you're new here at Liberty is a class we call Next Steps. And in Next Steps, you get to meet the whole pastoral staff and uh, ministry staff. Uh, you get uh, to learn more about our beliefs and how you can get connected at a deeper level. So that's next Sunday. If you're new to Liberty, next Sunday it takes place during the second hour, the second worship service. I think it's at 1015. You can get more information out at the info desk on your way out today. But if you're new to Liberty, May 2023, the year you get uh, engaged, all right? It'll, it'll bless you um, and bless your family. Well, if you've been with us uh, these last couple of Sundays, we are in the book of Daniel. If you want to follow along in a Bible, we're in Daniel chapter 4 today. We've just been kind of going uh, chapter by chapter and looking at some of these uh, familiar stories to many of us, right? And I think maybe today's will be familiar to some of you. If not, if this is your first reading of Daniel chapter 4, you're in for a treat because uh, it's a fascinating account. And if you've been with us, then you know that one of the primary characters in Daniel's life up until now in the book is a wicked pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar. He's the king of Babylon. Shows up many times in the first few chapters of Daniel. Uh, but today uh, is the is the last mention of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he fades off uh, the pages of Scripture. Uh, he's never mentioned again in the Bible after Daniel chapter 4. And so this morning, I'm going to title the message, King Nebuchadnezzar's Last Words. Uh, these are not necessarily his last words in life, but these are his last words recorded for us in the Bible and um, based on what we've learned about him so far, you may be kind of surprised at what Nebuchadnezzar's last words are. Because if you've been with us, then you know that uh, up until chapter 4, you know, chapters 1, 2, and 3, Nebuchadnezzar is just doing the, uh, the thing that all pagan, arrogant, self-centered, idol-worshiping dictators do. Uh, he's been, uh, he's been uh, worshiping other gods. You know, he's, he's not serious about the one true God. Um, Nebuchadnezzar has this bad habit of cutting people into pieces and turning their houses into rubble when he doesn't get, when he doesn't get his way. He throws people into fiery furnaces. That was last Sunday, Daniel. I mean, just, you know, chapter after chapter, this Nebuchadnezzar is just, you know, a piece of work. And so you may be surprised at the very last words recorded by Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. It's Daniel 4, verse 37 and it simply, he simply says this, those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. That's Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. End of it, okay? We never hear from him again in the scriptures. And Nebuchadnezzar's story here, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, what we might call his swan song in Daniel chapter 4, teaches us uh, not only about the dangers of pride, and it's true for Nebuchadnezzar, it's true for you and I, pride can get us into all kinds of trouble, but not only is this chapter about the dangers of pride, but it's also about the incredible mercy and patience of God, which is something worth celebrating this morning. So let's take a look at it together. Um, Daniel chapter 4, it begins with King Nebuchadnezzar writing a letter, a kind of a personal letter. Uh, we might say it's more of a, a royal proclamation. Uh, most Bible scholars believe this is written near the end of his life. And if we didn't know it better, if we didn't know better, we might think that we were reading um, not a letter from a pagan godless king, but rather a, 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 a psalm of praise or a hymn of praise from a godly king, like maybe somebody like David. That's how it reads, surprisingly enough. But take a look, Daniel chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 1 says, King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, now, of course, in Bible times, we've talked about this before. In Bible times, they always put their name at the beginning of the letter because they would be writing on like a scroll that you had to unfold as you read it. And so they'd want to put their name at the beginning so they, people would know who it was from. They would have to wait till the end. So, they, so it starts off with, King Nebuchadnezzar to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. 
How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Wow. I mean, doesn't that read like something maybe godly King David would say? That doesn't necessarily sound like Nebuchadnezzar. However, if you've been with us in this series so far, you may be a little skeptical about the sincerity of Nebuchadnezzar's praise because he has said some things like that before, hasn't he? If you've been with us, you know that at the um, end of chapter 2, when he has this terrible dream, and nobody in the whole kingdom can interpret the dream, but God gives Daniel the ability to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Nebuchadnezzar is so impressed by that, he, he gives praise to God. He says, wow, that's, that is impressive. My gods can't do that. So, so you know, th there was that. And if you were with us last Sunday, uh, at the end of chapter 3, we read it together. Um, Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego into the fiery furnace, and God miraculously delivers them. And what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, he praises God. He's like, man, I, I can't believe this is happening. That is some God you guys serve. Incredible. But remember last Sunday, and it comes up again this Sunday, it's one thing to praise God in the moment. It's quite another to surrender to God for a lifetime. And Nebuchadnezzar, typically, as it was, you know, when, when he saw God do something incredible, amazing, he praised God in that moment, but then he'd just go back to his idol-worshiping pagan customs. Because it's, it's a big, big difference between praising God in a moment and surrendering to God for a lifetime. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, doesn't do that. He pre-praised him in the moment, but um, what we're going to find in chapter 4 <laughs> is that God humbles this proud king. He really does bring Nebuchadnezzar to his knees, or we might say to all fours, if you, if you know this account, if you're familiar with this account. See, Nebuchadnezzar had gone his whole life never surrendering to the Lord. But many people believe, and I would put myself in this category as well, that as chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has a conversion experience. That, that we're going to, I would say, we're, we're probably going to see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven and that's just a testimony to God's mercy based on what we know about him. But let's just see how this unfolds. Verse 4 begins, uh, he begins to recount this experience that he had earlier in his life, okay? So he's, he's looking back on this, and, and, and he's talking about a, an event that took place in his life that really left an impression upon him. I like to call these things spiritual markers, if you're, a, if you're a follower of Christ, you've probably got some spiritual markers in your life sometime in the past where God did something in you or through you or for you um, or to you. God did something and it left a mark on you. And, and after that, uh, your relationship with God was never the same. And, and probably when you give your testimony about how God has worked in your life and has helped you grow in your faith, you probably point out some of those spiritual markers where God really showed up. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. He's pointing us back to something that happened in his life that really left a, an impression, a mark, and it changed him. It changed his relationship with God, the one true God, forever. Well, this is one of Nebuchadnezzar's spiritual markers. Verse 4, here's what he says. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at my home in my palace, contented, and prosperous. So he is, uh, he's living the dream, okay? He, he's standing on top of the world. You know, he's just looking out over his kingdom, and wow, I have got it made, contented and prosperous. But verse 5 says, I had a dream that made me afraid, and I was lying in bed. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Now, we're not going to take the time to read the whole chapter, but just let me summarize Nebuchadnezzar's bad dream, this nightmare that terrified him. I encourage you to read it later. But Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about a giant, uh, fruitful, enormous tree that reaches to the heavens. And under that tree, everyone falls under its authority. Everyone falls under its protection. Both man and beast are under the authority of this tree. And then suddenly, in the dream, a voice calls out from heaven and says, cut the tree down. 
strip the tree of its leaves, scatter its fruit, leave the stump and the roots in the ground, and let the dew rest on the stump for seven times, it says, or seven years is what that means. It's kind of this crazy dream. So Nebuchadnezzar, you know, okay, there's this tree, and, uh, and it's got all this authority, and everything's under it, but then it gets cut down, and the stump stays in the ground, the roots stay in the ground, and the dew of heaven lays on this tree, or this stump, for seven years. And he's perplexed by this. He's clearly troubled by this dream. He doesn't know what it means. And so, what does Nebuchadnezzar do when he has a dream? We've learned this already. He calls together all his... Uh, enchanters and, you know, all his masters of the dark arts, you know, <laughs> they get out their Ouija boards and all that, you know, all those demonic type things. And he calls them together and he tells them the dream and they can't figure it out. They don't know what it means. So once again, he reaches out just like he did back in chapter two, he reaches out to our man, Daniel. And Daniel comes and interprets the dream for him. So look at verse 18. So this is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, now remember, Daniel's name got changed to Belteshazzar um, back in chapter one as part of that Babylonian custom. So he comes to Daniel, he says, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. Now, just think about that for a moment. It's one thing to have a bad dream, a nightmare that scares you, but you can tell it's a really bad dream when you tell other people and it scares them, <laughs> okay? I mean, that's, that's pretty severe. So Daniel, you know, he starts to understand. God gives him the ability to understand this dream and what it means, and he's terrified. And by this time, Daniel had probably developed a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar, um, and uh, and, you know, he, 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 he understands what it means, so he's really concerned for Nebuchadnezzar. So um, the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. So Daniel proceeds to interpret the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And again, we're not going to read the whole chapter here, but just to summarize, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, okay, king, you know that giant tree that reaches to the heavens and has everything under its authority and then gets cut down to a stump? Nebuchadnezzar, you are that tree. Your kingdom has grown. Your authority has grown. You've got all this power, all this success, contented and prosperous. You know, all these things under your authority, both man and beast. And yet you've never surrendered yourself to God. You've never acknowledged the one true God. And so that God is going to cut you down. And the Lord gets pretty creative here with his judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, look at what Daniel says, uh, verse 24. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Isn't that amazing? Well, what this is telling Nebuchadnezzar is that God's gonna actually cause him to lose his mind. He's going to go insane and start thinking and acting like a ox or a cow in the field. I mean, this, this, he's just gonna become deranged to the point that we're gonna find he's taken from the palace and put out in the field with all the cattle and the livestock. And I was thinking about that, just kind of picturing that this last week and did a little extended research on it. Here's something you may not have known. There is actually a medical diagnosis for this condition. It is a rare psychological disorder called boanthropy. It's true. You're looking at me like you don't believe it. No, boanthropy. Google it. It's, uh, 
It's true. The, the, uh, there, there was a case reported in, I think, I think I read 1946, of someone who lost their mind. Or they went insane and started acting and thinking they were a cow or an ox, and, uh, and <laughs> which is, you know, some of you are thinking right now, Pastor Andrew. No, that is utterly ridiculous. Okay. No. You deserve better, I know. You deserve better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm getting deeper, aren't I? Okay. Look what it says. Let's get, come back to the Bible. That's always the solution. Um, seven times, which symbolizes seven years in Daniel. Seven times will pass by for you, you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. And so you're starting to see God's purpose in this, right? God is wanting to humble Nebuchadnezzar. You know, the Bible says that God appeals to you and I to humble ourselves. You find those two words together uh, many times throughout the scriptures. Humble yourself before the Lord. But here's how it works. If you and I are not willing to humble ourselves, then God in his mercy will humble us. And that's what's happening here. You know, Nebuchadnezzar had all these chances to humble himself. He's seen God at work, right? He's had all these opportunities, but he refuses to humble himself. And so now Daniel predicts, as he interprets this dream, God, the Holy One, is going to show you firsthand that at Nebuchadnezzar, you don't rule, heaven rules, he rules. And this dream predicts that exactly. Well, in light of the, in light of the interpretation, now that both Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel know what it means, in light of that, Daniel makes this appeal to Nebuchadnezzar. Humble yourself before it's too late. You got one more chance here. I'm telling you, maybe, just maybe, if you turn, turn uh, away from your sin, if you repent of your sin, God won't do this. He won't turn you into this insane person who thinks they're a cow. Look at verse 27. Uh, this is Daniel speaking. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. You see what Daniel's saying? He's saying, I know the Lord is patient. I know the Lord is gracious. He is long-suffering he, he's willing to forgive those who repent. So, so Nebuchadnezzar, maybe before it's too late, before you experience this judgment, you can turn your heart away from your sin and surrender yourself to the Lord. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't repent. He doesn't heed Daniel's counsel. And in all candor, why would he? Why would he? He's the most powerful man in the world. Nobody's even close. What did we read in the first part of the chapter? I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at my palace, contented and prosperous. That's a very difficult place to turn from your sin and surrender to God. When you're content and prosperous, that's why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven. And what was true of Nebuchadnezzar is true of you and I typically, is that we will not repent when we see the light. We typically will only repent when we feel the heat. And Nebuchadnezzar's about to feel the heat. That's true, right? I mean, we, typically we just don't, you know, we don't change. We might hear something, hey, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, I think I probably agree with that. But that, that doesn't change us. Because we don't change when we see the light, typically. We only change when we feel the heat. God has to kind of Tighten up the screws and, and, and get our attention. And as long as you're content and prosperous, if you haven't surrendered yourself to the Lord, it's very difficult to see your need to do that. So God has to help us. And that's what he does here with Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 29. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said... Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? 
And we're like, oh no, I see a lightning bolt, <laughs> right? You know, that kind of arrogance, man. You just know something is coming. And sure enough, verse 31 says, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. I mean, again, God's judgment's pretty creative here in Nebuchadnezzar's case. But isn't that just an amazing thing? You know, history records Nebuchadnezzar as being an extremely uh, brilliant person. He was a great military strategist. He was uh, an engineer, right? He oversaw the creation of one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, uh, the Hanging Gardens of Nebuchadnezzar. That's what they're called. So he was, he was brilliant. No one on the face of the earth at this time was more successful or more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar. And here we see God reducing him to a cow, he loses his mind to the point that he's banished from the palace, ends up in the barnyard, not wanting to do anything else but graze and eat grass. He doesn't bathe. He doesn't keep himself groomed. He doesn't cut his hair. So his nasty hair just becomes, you know, matted, metaphorically speaking, you know, like, like the feathers of a bird. He doesn't cut his nails. They become like claws. I mean, he's a beast of the field. And you see, he had these opportunities to humble himself, but he didn't, so God humbles him. And that goes on for seven years. Seven years. Okay, well, well, that's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. But if you come down to verse 34, um, we have you know, Nebuchadnezzar back present day recounting his own story, and look what he says. Verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. That's the key line in the whole story. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And once again, Daniel was spot on with his interpretation because look at verse 36. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. Okay, so he's out in the field. His advisors and his nobles sought him out. And he says, I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Wow. Wow. That is an incredible story. That's quite a testimony. I've got some spiritual markers in my life. I've got a testimony. Not quite, not quite as dramatic as that one. But in many ways, Nebuchadnezzar's story is your story, and it's my story. And here in Daniel chapter 4, there are three uh, very practical lessons that I want to leave you with this morning because these are things that God will use in our lives, these truths that God will use in our lives to help us grow and to help us understand not only the mercy of God but the dangers of pride. Okay, so three lessons from Daniel chapter 4. And I'll, you know, just keep them very simple as we walk through them. The first one is this. What we see here is that God is rich in mercy and incredibly patient. Rich in mercy and incredibly patient. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. God is long-suffering, rich in mercy, incredibly patient. We see that all over Nebuchadnezzar's life. And here's why I say that. Throughout, if you've been with us especially, you'll see this. God has been pursuing Nebuchadnezzar for years. Every chapter of the book up to this point, God is revealing himself to Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 2, you know, chapter 1 really, God... God brings a godly man, Daniel, into Nebuchadnezzar's life. 
I doubt, Daniel's a pagan, I mean, a, Nebuchadnezzar's a pagan Babylonian king. He's surrounded by pagans. <clears throat> he doesn't know any God-fearing Jews like Daniel. God in his grace brings a godly man into his life to influence him. Chapter two, he puts him in con personal contact with Daniel and Daniel interprets his dream and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar's amazed. Wow, Daniel, that is some God you serve there. So you, so you see God just revealing himself to Nebuchadnezzar. If you were with us last week, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar throws Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. And Jesus Christ himself, the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, we talked about that Christophany, shows up in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace and he's like, hey, wait a minute, didn't we just throw three guys in there? And Nebuchadnezzar with his own eyes sees a fourth guy, and again, it's a manifestation of Christ. And once again, you see God showing himself, revealing himself, pursuing a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't just leave him to himself. He's, he's giving him these opportunities, these glimpses. Even in chapter four, we just read it, you know, God gives him this dream, and Daniel interprets the dream, and between the time the dream is interpreted and the judgment falls, it says, verse 29, it's 12 months later. I mean, it wasn't immediate. You know, Nebuchadnezzar got the word from God, you know, repent or else, and God still waits another year, 12 months, before he says, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to have to step up the pressure on you. So all in all, God has been pursuing a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar for over 30 years. That's a lot of grace. That's a lot of mercy. And that's a lot of patience. And um, I would guess in a crowd this size that many of you could give your own testimony of the Lord's mercy and patience in your story, how God pursued you, and how God gave you these opportunities and these glimpses and brought people into your life and circumstances into your life. And, and you didn't know it at the time. But you have these spiritual markers of, of God pursuing you and showing himself gracious and merciful. And you look back now and you say, oh man, why didn't I see it back then? That's what's happening in King Nebuchadnezzar's life. And, and don't ever lose hope or give up on the mercy of God in the lives of other people. Uh, you may have people in your life who you're praying for and you're concerned about and they're far from the Lord and the devil you know, kind of tempts you. Hey, there's no way that person's ever gonna come back. I want you to know, listen, this story shows us God is pursuing them. Don't ever forget the mercy and patience of God. He is pursuing them. Pray that God brings Dan a Daniel into their life. You know, who can, just God's way of showing mercy. And, and, and trying to establish this relationship with them. Over 30 years, God's been pursuing Nebuchadnezzar. And he finally goes to drastic measures and catches him. And Nebuchadnezzar bows his knee and surrenders to the one true God. There's a great verse in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And Peter says this, God is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to eternal life. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never opened up your life to the Lord. You know, God's been pursuing you. You're not here by accident this morning. And I want you to know, God's been patient. Now his patience, it runs out eventually with Nebuchadnezzar, right? If I, you know, the judgment falls. But, but God's been so patient and so merciful. And he has you here this morning to hear this word. Have you surrendered to him? Uh, can't you see in your past how God's been pursuing a relationship with you to get you to this moment and he's just waiting on you to surrender God is rich in mercy and incredibly patient here's a second lesson too nothing is more detrimental to our relationship with God than pride enough said there's really nothing, any, actually any of our relationships with anybody, nothing is more detrimental than pride. But especially in our relationship with God, because you see, it's pride that prevents us from surrendering to the Lord. 
That's what God was going after in Nebuchadnezzar's life. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar would give these moments of praise, but he never surrendered his life to the Lord until chapter 4. His uh, pride is in high definition, isn't it, in verse 30, where he says, "Is, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? See, that was what was keeping him from God, his pride. And nothing is more detrimental. C.S. Lewis said, Pride is always looking down on things and people, and as long as you're looking down, you cannot see what is above you. That was Nebuchadnezzar's problem. Always looking down on everyone and everything. Look what I've got. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished for my glory and my majesty. Nebuchadnezzar's problem is what your problem and my problem can be sometimes, and that is we don't recognize everything in our lives as a gift from God. It's a gift from the Lord. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's generous with us. But if we're not careful, we'll let those blessings and that generosity go to our head. We'll start thinking that I've done this. I've accomplished this. And that's why God's message to him through Daniel in verse 25 is you're going to suffer seven years until you understand. That's what the word, until you understand that God gives kingdoms to whoever he chooses for his purposes. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. God gives out his kingdoms to whoever he wants to accomplish his purposes, Nebuchadnezzar. It's not because you're so great. Verse 26, Daniel says, God's going to humble you until you acknowledge that heaven rules. Until you acknowledge that there's only one king, and he doesn't live in Babylon. He lives in heaven. And so so Daniel's just pleading with Nebuchadnezzar, turn from your wicked ways, repent. Maybe you can avoid this judgment, but he's so proud, he doesn't listen. Pride is what keeps us from surrendering to the Lord. There's There's something that the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that is a great reminder to us it'll guard us against becoming too puffed up and too proud when God blesses us with more than we deserve I want you to see what it says it's 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 here's what he says what do you have that God hasn't given you and if everything you have is from God why boast as though it were not a gift hey listen that truth will help keep us grounded. That truth will help us remember every good thing in our lives is a gift from the generous hand of God. And when we view our time as a gift from God, when we view our money as a gift from God, when we view our talents or our abilities as a gift from God, it leaves no room for sinful pride. And the way you can tell that humility is starting to work in your life and you're starting to recognize that everything is a gift from God, you start to become more generous with those things, with your time, with your money. It's no no longer all about you with your gifts, with your abilities. It's no longer all about building your kingdom. It's about building God's kingdom through you. That's how you can tell that you view everything as a gift from him. You, You surrender it to the one true king. And isn't it interesting, did you see this in verse 27, that when Daniel is pleading with Nebuchadnezzar to repent and change his ways, look what he says, verse 27, accept my advice, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed, it may be then that your prosperity will continue. And Daniel's just saying, you've had your eyes on yourself this whole time. Your kingdom, all your resources, all your gifts and talents has always been about you. It's never been about others. It's never been about God. You, you haven't shown kindness or compassion. You haven't been generous. But maybe if you will, you know, God will stay his hand of judgment. But if you don't, judgment will fall. And Nebuchadnezzar's pride was too great. He just wouldn't listen. And so, for seven years, he's humbled. You know, instead of humbling himself before the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar had to have God humble him. And for seven years, that's what happened. 
But then something changed. Nebuchadnezzar, look what it says in verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. And again, many believe that's Nebuchadnezzar's conversion account. When for the first time in his life, after God severely humbled him, he turned his eyes toward heaven and sought mercy and surrendered his kingdom to the one true king, the one who has the kingdom that endures from generation to generation. So that third lesson from Daniel 4 is that God is willing to restore the repentant heart. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful word, isn't it? In Nebuchadnezzar's life, we see it on display it took him 30 years, seven really painful years, but he, God finally got his attention and he finally humbles himself and surrenders his life to the Lord. The takeaway for you and I is the question, who wears the throne? Who wears the, the crown in your life? Who's on the throne of your life? As long as you want to be king, you can't let God's not going to be king. You have to willingly surrender your life to him. Nebuchadnezzar finally got to that point. It took a long time. God pursued him. God was merciful. God was gracious. God was firm when he needed to be firm. And Nebuchadnezzar finally got the point that there's, there's only one king. There's only room for one king. There's only one crown. And either I'll choose to wear it in my own life or I'll willingly give it to the Lord and let him wear it and be the Lord over my life. Who's the king over your life? Have you surrendered to him? God's been pursuing you. God's not above getting your attention. Listen, the safest place to be in your life and mine is right in the center of God's will, submitting to him. Let me encourage you, dear friend. You're not here by accident. We have the great blessing of hearing God's word here in this church every Sunday. And God wants a return on that investment he's making in us. So he calls us to surrender. And the good news is, no matter how far you've gotten away from that, no matter how far your life has gotten off track, God is willing to restore the repentant heart. God cannot resist a humble, repentant heart. Not even if you're Nebuchadnezzar. Such a testimony to his grace. Let me ask you to stand if you would, please. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heads are bowed, and maybe this is the moment for you to surrender your life to the Lord. Maybe you came to church this morning, and you've never opened up your life to Jesus Christ. You've kind of been calling your own shots. You've been doing your own thing. Maybe contented and prosperous, the way Nebuchadnezzar described himself. But God has you here this morning to hear this word, to see Nebuchadnezzar's testimony before you, and maybe see some similarities in your life. God's calling you to repent. Turn from your sin. Turn to the Lord who loves you and let him forgive your sin. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus this morning, but uh, the world has gotten in you. Babylon has gotten, in, gotten inside of you and, and you're starting to follow its customs more than surrendering your life to the Lord, holding things back. Maybe your time and your talents and your money and uh, your gifts and abilities that they've that you've been using them to build your kingdom grow your kingdom instead of God's kingdom well, hear what God is saying surrender to me yield yourself to me put your life in a place of blessing I'll restore you if you'll submit to me gracious heavenly father we pray your holy spirit would accomplish your purposes in each and every one of our lives this morning through your word we pray that in Jesus most powerful name Amen and amen. You guys have a good rest of your weekend. You are loved.